y'all doing? Hello. Can y'all hear us? Oh, there what it is. is What's up, up? PBC? Who's ready for chapel? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Guys, we have like six weeks left. We're almost to the end of the semester. Yeah. And this is prayer week chapel. We're going to... We're going to end prayer week, right? Natalie, what do we got going on? Yeah, well, so we have a couple of announcements before we get into it. Um, first, we have graduation, which is coming up. It's going to be on May 15th at 2 p.m. right here. So be sure to mark your calendars. And for everyone who is graduating, everyone's going to get four tickets to give to family or friends. And you will need a ticket in order to come in. So be sure to communicate with your families, sort all of that info out. We also have... Yeah, so in two weeks, so not next week, but the week after, we have International Week. Woo! And so, yeah, it's going to be great. Oh, Something yeah. as our, our PBC family that we love celebrating is our international students. And we're taking a whole week for that. We're going to have lunches set aside, handmade food from the, co the countries that they're representing. Yes. It's going gonna to be, be awesome. Is Canada Day? There's not going to be a Canada oh, day to this semester. But, but the but, countries represented are going to be so good. <laughs> but it's so going to be fun. amazing. You guys don't want to miss out. Yeah. What else do we got going on? And then tonight we have All Night Prayer. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> so you do not want to miss this. This is one of the best events that we do in the whole semester. <laughs> so it starts at 11 p.m. and we're going to have food at 1030. So be sure to be there. It's going to be here at Rocky View and it's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. And um, with that, we're going to transition to giving life here to the offering section. And um, if our verse can pop up here, it's going to be, thank you, Natalie. <laughs> it's going to be uh, Luke 16, 10, and it says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And this verse really exemplifies the way that God gives us things, but then watches what we do with them. Because the things that we get aren't just for us, they're also for a blessing for his kingdom, for people who need it. And so we are, uh, we're gonna go into offering and um, if you guys have money that you guys wanna give, it's going towards PBC. It's actually kind of a pay it forward thing that this money is used for campus events, things that fun, uh, things that we can celebrate as a fellowship, as a family, as community together. And so if you guys wanna pay it forward, if you guys wanna give a little money back to PBC, here's some ways to give here. You can either scan here for the QR code or you can go to Cash App. The screen looks just like this and then give to PBC, give number two, PBC. Um, and so if you guys are wanting to give, those are our two ways. You can also give online through, um, through well, just these two ways, I guess online's Mana House only. But anyway, we're gonna pray and then get into worship here. So why don't you guys bow your heads and let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you for for everything that you've given us, God. Thank you, Lord, that it's not only for us, but it's for others, God. It's to give back to our community, to give back and help each other and support each other, Father. I pray, Lord, that as we go into worship, we reflect on all that's been done for us, God, all that you've done for us, all that you've done for PBC and Manor House, God. Um, and I pray that we come with grateful hearts before you. In your name, Jesus, amen.
Before your majesty we bow down Yeah I will bow down on my knees and give you praise I will bow down on my knees and give you praise yeah. Keep singing this, keep singing this. Everything has to bow down before Jesus. Fear, anxiety, depression, diseases, everything has to bow down before
this week in preparing for all night prayer, you have felt like you've just experienced, you know, the presence of God every day, or maybe you felt like you have been striving, like God has felt distant, or you felt not very consistent or disciplined or just less than a devoted follower of Jesus. But the good news is that God's ability to move on our behalf is not dependent on our love for him. It's dependent on his love for us, that he would send his son for us. And it's something we all think we know, but I think it's something I need to be reminded of all the time that no amount of striving, no amount of working will ever earn what God has already given me graciously. And so, God, I just pray today that you would move on our behalf, that you would remind us of your great love for us, that it's not dependent on who we are, but it's dependent on who you are, God, and that we would continue to walk in that love, that our sacrifice and our worship and our praise would not be us trying to earn your love, but just an expression and a response to what you have already done for us, Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you, worship team. Such a good job today. Um, so if you guys don't already know, we like to do senior sermons here at PBC. Coming to the end of the semester, we like to honor our seniors and give them a chance to share what is on their heart. So if you guys want to stay standing, you know her by her love, you know her by her leadership, and you probably know her by her laugh. Can we all give it up for Vanessa Wallace? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> hey guys, um, I'm Vanessa. If you don't know who I am, um, I'm a senior here at PVC, and I'm honestly just so grateful for everyone who came here. Um, chapel was one of my favorite things at PBC, and it's something that I hold really, really dear to my heart. I just want to thank you guys for all coming. Um, thank you for everyone at PBC, people who are online. Thanks for joining in. And thank you to MCA for coming as well. Um, I don't know if you recognize me, but yes, I do work custodial. So if you see me around, you might recognize me if I had like a mask and like walking around with a trash bag. So if you thought that's where you knew me from, you're correct. Um, so yeah. Um, I think Jackson and Sarah actually mentioned that one of the traditions here at PBC oh, when you do a senior sermon is to just um, to just do a bunch of thank yous, and I think that's very honorable, and that's something that I am very honored to do is I get to stand up here and I get to um, honor everyone who has spoken into my life and has changed my life for the good. And I want to start off with my mom and my dad, and <laughs> they're the reasons why I was even able to come to PBC in the first place. Like... I took a year off of school, so like after I graduated from high school, I took a year and I really didn't know what I was doing. So I had no money, I had nothing, and then I finally found out that I wanted to come to PBC, but again, I had no money. So my parents really helped me financially, they worked so, so hard. My parents are the most hardworking people I've ever met. I'm not just being biased. They're literally the hardest working people. My dad wakes up at four in the morning every day just to go to work and then comes back at three and takes care of my autistic brother. And that's another job in itself. And same goes for my mom. She works two jobs and she does the same. She comes home and she takes care of her kids and they've done it without complaining. And that's something that's very admirable to me and something that I wanna be when I grow up. So I wanna thank them for making me able to come to PBC. And the next group of people I wanna thank are my teachers and my friends for making me stay at PBC, because I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I was actually very, very awkward when I first got here. Like, I couldn't even like look people in the eyes. Like, I was just like this scared person that just moved from Canada, and I had no idea like what I was doing here. And I actually, um, I don't know, the freshmen haven't gone to experience this yet, but we actually like have camp. And at camp, I, it was the first week of being at PBC and I literally was sitting there and I was like, I think I'm gonna leave. <laughs> like, this is kind of awkward. Like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't think I'm meant to be here. So I'm probably just gonna go home after this. And I remember talking to someone and they're like, uh, I think you should actually like wait, like maybe two or three weeks, like you moved from Canada. I don't think you should be moving back right away. Like maybe give it some time. 
I was like, okay, two weeks, that's still a long time to just sit here and be awkward, but I'll just do it anyways. And here I am four years later. I, <laughs> yep. So like the biggest thank you I could give is to the teachers and the faculty. And I just, honestly, I fell in love with your guys' teaching and I fell in love with the passion that you guys have for the Bible. And I just, I couldn't imagine being here without just knowing that I was in good hands with all of you guys. And with all my friends at PVC, I made so many like really, really close friends that I'm gonna keep for the rest of my life and I owe it all to this place. And this was one of the easiest decisions to stay four years. I also was only gonna be here for two years, but then God changed that plan as well. So um, I am very, very grateful for all of you guys and the faculty and the teachers and all of my friends. And you guys know who you are. And even if I haven't, if I'm not that close with you guys, you still are a part of my story and still part of this PBC story. So thank you so much. And then the last people I would like to thank is my youth pastors, Sean and Val, for making me have the desire to even be in ministry. And they are amazing. They have seen me at my worst. They've seen me at my best. And honestly, they are the reason why I even fell in love with ministry. Um, Sean and Val, they were my youth pastors. And I just saw how Sean loved people. And I saw how Val loved people. And I was like, like to be a youth pastor, like guys, I think you, we kind of take it for granted. Like youth pastors, they go through a lot. Like they have to deal with a lot of things. And to see someone so fully invested in what they do, like that's something that's that impresses me every single day. So I just really wanted to thank them and their family, the Lalonde family. Um, they're the reasons why I'm here. And they're the re they showed me what my calling was because I had so much trouble um, listening to the voice of God and they really helped me like understand what that was and they made me fall in love with ministry. Um, so I'm very thankful that I get to be up here today and I get to share a message that has been on my heart for a very, very long time. And this is something that I think doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's something that has been on my heart for a very long time. So if you guys want a, uh, if you guys are taking notes, I have a title and it's called Good Grief. I don't know if it's gonna come up there. Shout out to Priscilla. She made the graphic for me. And thank you to Elizabeth for resizing it because it didn't fit the first time. So she just had to do some of that stuff. Um, so we're gonna start, oh actually, so I'm gonna share with you guys two stories today. And the first story is um, a story in Mark that most of you might be familiar with, but if you're not, don't worry, I'm gonna let you guys know, I'm gonna read it to you guys. And then the second story is gonna be something that's very, um, a very personal story. It's one of the um, hardest things that I've ever had to deal with, um, not only at PBC, but in my entire life. <laughs> and so if I get emotional, I'm sorry, I tend to cry a lot, so just bear with me. Um, so we're gonna start, if you guys have your Bibles or whatever it is, we're gonna start in Mark 5, um, chapter 21. Or, oh my gosh, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Um, and I'll just give you a second to flip there. And also, don't roast me. I actually have my Bible open to the verse, but I had to make it bigger on the paper because I can't read. I didn't want to bring my glasses up here, so I'm going to be reading off the paper. Well, my Bible is here, and I'm at the right verse, so don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you guys are there. So I'm just gonna read it out. And when Jesus had crossed again into the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with them. <laughs> So <laughs> that's a pretty intense starting. Like Jesus just lands on the bone. There's already a crowd and this man comes up to him, falls down and is like, I need you to come heal my daughter. She's dying. And I know you're the only one that's gonna be able to do this. And that's kind of the first thing that I noticed about this story is that you can see, and even in just the saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. 
that's a really like kind of desperate thing to do, especially with someone you don't know, and especially with um, just the intensity of it all. And just for context, like this is when Jesus was starting to get really well known, and he was healing people, he was casting demons out of people. Like people were knowing who he was, and Jairus knew he's like, if I could just get this man to come to my house, then I'm going to be able, then my daughter is going to be able to get healed. And and the other thing that I noticed about the story is that Jesus Jesus just followed him and he's like, okay, let's go. Like he didn't say, oh, I actually have to heal this other person first and I actually have a lot of people in line, like you have to wait. Jesus was like, okay, let's go. So he started walking and they're on their way to Jairus' house. Um, so just keep that in the back of your minds and I'm gonna jump into the other story that I have for you guys. Um, so if you guys remember that the people that I mentioned earlier, Sean and Val, my youth pastors, um, this is a story about their family and about what they went through. And I have a picture of them, if it will come up. There they are. Look how cute they are. They're amazing. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, the girl over here. This is Jenna. And then it goes Jovi, Quentin, Val and Sean, and then it's Mila and Lennon. And this is a family that's very close to my heart. They, are, they were my youth pastors. They fed me multiple times. They've taken me into their house, and they're just very, they're so encouraging and such loving people. And the person that I want to highlight in this story today is Sean. Um, he was, um, as I said before, one of the people that made me um, fall in love with ministry, and I saw how he led people, and I was a part of his youth team, and it was something that was so fun, and I loved working with him, and I loved being a part of his team, and Sean was honestly the classic youth pastor, like he was, no offense to any youth pastors are here, I think, I don't know if Eugene's here, but I don't know if he made it, but um, youth pastors can kind of be a little nuts, like a little crazy, like they're kind of like in your face, they're energetic, they're hanging out with little kids all the, like not little kids, sorry, youth kids all the time, and they're just like, they have to be super energetic and super like ready to go all the time, so Sean was kind of psycho, like he was always in your face, and he was always like, man, let's hang out, like let's all go hang out, like I remember like after youth services, Shyla over here, she was a part of the youth group as well, um, we would have youth on Tuesday nights, which is weird because I thought Youth was always on Tuesday nights, but then I came here, it was actually on Wednesday nights. But anyways, um, we would have youth on Tuesdays, which means it fell on like a cheap night, like a cheap movie night, so we would go to the theaters. And we would finish tearing down youth at like 9.30 or 10 every Tuesday, and he's like, you guys wanna go to the movies after? And we're like, Sean, we have school. Like we were all in high school still. And we're like, what are you talking about? Like we wanna go to bed. And he's like, no guys, like let's go to the movies. Like this is gonna be so fun. And every time he convinced us to go to the movie theater and we were all like kind of annoyed but we just wanted to do it for Sean cause he wanted to hang out still. And he was always the one to like be annoying at the movie theater as well. So like he would laugh super loud at the randomest parts of the movie. He would purposely drop his candy so like it would make a noise and like everyone would stare like you guys would not enjoy Sean if he was at the movie theater like we all we didn't even enjoy it but for some reason we went with him every Tuesday and I don't know why we did that um and another thing funny thing about Sean is that he had this weird like love for Chuck E. Cheese like I don't know why like we were actually <laughs> So actually he drove all of us youth kids, like we had, I don't know how many people were on this youth trip, but we actually were coming to GU conference and he drove all of us down here. So it was like an eight to 10 hour drive. And this was the, I don't know if you guys remember, but this is when conference got canceled and it was my first conference and I was so excited and Sean was so upset. He was so sad that we couldn't go. So we're looking around, looking for other things to do and he sees a Chuck E. Cheese and he's like, oh my gosh, Chuck E. Cheese. And I was like, I have never been there before. Why are you freaking out? And he like looks at me, he's like, you've never been to Chuck E. Cheese. And all of us are like, I don't think there's Chuck E. Cheese in Canada. So I think that's kind of why we don't go, but um, <laughs> that could be the reason. <laughs> um, but I was like, yeah, I have never been there. So we, he drives so fast and he, we park at Chuck E. Cheese and he runs in and it's closed. And he, I've never, like, he started crying. And I was like, 
dude, are you, like this is a 40 year old man crying because he can't bring his youth kids to Chuck E. Cheese. I was like, okay, I don't know who you are anymore. I have no idea. But that's kind of just a short summary of who Sean was. He was so, he was so happy. He was so excited to hang out with us. He, I've never seen someone so relational before and loving every type of person. I'm, guys, I'm talking about every type of person, like even the people that we all got annoyed with or like people that just weren't getting it. He like still loved them and he still hung out with them. And then that was literally like the, the biggest thing that I've ever taken away from him and his ministry. Um, so yeah, I really, he holds a really big place in my heart. And now I'm gonna jump over to when I was a freshman uh, coming at PBC. It was my, the end of my first semester and I was ready to go home, go back to Canada for a month. And I get this call from Sean. And you know when there's like, someone calls you, like your mom calls you and you're like, oh, nuts, like something's happening, like I did something wrong. I kind of had that feeling, it was like, oh, am I in trouble? Or is like something happening? Like what's going on? Like I just didn't feel good about it. So I answered the phone. And he goes, hey, Vanessa, like, how are you doing? Like, how's it going? I'm like, hey, Sean, like, what's up? And I just woke up. Like, this was early in the morning. And I literally was, like, on the floor. I was sleeping in someone else's dorm room. So I was literally on the floor, like, kind of dead. Like, what's going on? And then he's like, hey, I have something to tell you. I just want to let you know before you find out um, through anybody else. And I was like, okay, like, shoot, like, go ahead. And he's like, Vanessa, I have cancer. And... At that point, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that, that doesn't fall. Like, that's not your life. That's not your plan. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And he's like, I know. But he goes, it's um, stage four liver cancer. And I'm like, I don't know much about cancer. But I was like, stage four seems like a pretty high stage. I don't know. <laughs> At the time, I was like, don't know how many stages there are. But four is pretty high. I don't know. Like, that sounds pretty bad. And he's like, yeah, but, um, and I start crying. I'm bawling my eyes out because, like, I have no idea what's going on. It's early in the morning. And he just goes, I'm not telling you that I'm dying or anything. Like, I'm telling you I'm sick. And it's like, okay. Like, we're going to fight for it. And we're going to fight for you. And this is when I'm put in Jairus' shoes, and I'm like, Sean is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on him and please heal him. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we go on. We have um, <clears throat> fundraisers and prayer nights and Facebook pages and like everyone's make, like we're making it known. We're like, okay, like let's all get in this together. We're going to go. We're going to gather a crowd and we're going to go and we're going to see Sean healed. Like that's what, that's the whole point. <clears throat> So now this is where you, fi where you find us and like his family and his friends and his youth teams. Like, okay, okay, like let's get this moving. Let's start praying. Let's start believing. Let's start prophesying that he's going to be okay. So now we're going to go back into Mark 5, um, verse 24. <clears throat> this is a kind of a long chunk of scripture, so just bear with me. Um, I'm just going to read it for you guys really quick. <clears throat> So a great crowd followed him and thronged upon him, which was like just crowded him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather getting worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came upon him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I can even touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. 
And I don't know if you guys zoned out while I was reading that, but I'm going to summarize that for you. So it happens that a crowd is forming. They're like, oh, Jesus is going to do it again. Like, let's go. Let's follow Jairus to his house, and he's going to perform another miracle, and we're going to get to witness it. And as he's walking, Jesus is, like, surrounded by all these people. And this woman is like, I know this man. Like, I've heard about this man, and I know him, and I know that if I can just get so close as to touch his garment, I will be made well because I've been sick for 12 years. So she's probably pushing and shoving, and, like, she's sick too, right? So she's trying to, like, push in the crowd, and she finally, like, finally gets it, finally touches it, and then immediately she's like, oh, I think it worked. Like, I don't know. So... And then Jesus stops. So he's on his way. He stops and he turns around. He's like, who just touched me? And his disciples are like, bro, you're being crowded. Like there's a million people like grabbing at you right now. Like what are you talking about? He's like, no, like someone touched me and and someone got healed and I want to know who it is. And the woman comes up and she's like, I'm so sorry. That was me. I I, forgive me, please. I just, I just had, I just knew that you were the healer and I knew you're the almighty Jesus. Like I knew and he says, he says over here, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And there's two things that popped up to me while I was reading this. First of all, if I was Jairus, I would have been both <laughs> annoyed and encouraged at the same time. I would have been like, okay, Jesus, like, let the main event, like, I get it. You can heal people. I get it. Like, you're in the middle of healing all these other people, but I need my daughter to get healed. I need this to happen right now and you're kind of stopping like we need to there's a time limit we're on a time crunch here so Jairus probably was a little like annoyed like dude this man she's like he's just chilling and walking like I need we need to go but also I can see Jairus being very encouraged like oh I got the right guy this is the right man like he just healed this girl okay there's no doubt anymore like this is the right person and feeling both encouraged but also like, Jesus, we don't have a lot of time. She's dying, like, I need you to come and I need you to come fast. And going back, now we're gonna um, go back into the other story. And at this point, Sean got diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. Um, A crowd started to form, everyone in our town knew about him, everyone knew that um, Sean was this amazing man, a, a father of five, and an amazing husband, and he was going through one of the worst things you could even imagine. And um, so a crowd was forming, and Sean got, di- I believe Sean got diagnosed around November or December of 2018. So it was a year and a half of ups and downs and God healing Sean and then other things were happening and then healing Sean again and then other things would happen and then obviously in a year and a half you hear a bunch of other stories of other people getting healed around the world and your friends getting healed and this person getting healed and you're like, okay, this is the right God, like we're serving the right guy um, and we're just waiting for this to happen and yeah, we're just like waiting for Jesus to show up and we're excited but we're also like, God, like he's getting sicker Like, you can see it. He's um, losing a lot of weight. He's walking slower. Like, you could just see it. Like, he's getting sicker. So, like, we get it, and we're excited for this big miracle. But you need to come, and you need to come really, really fast because there's not a lot of time left. So that's kind of where um, I'm going to jump back into Mark 5. Chapter, uh, Mark 5, verse 35. Um, And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Um, But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John and the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion of people weeping and wailing (coughs) loudly. So this is kind of where like, like someone comes up to Jairus and is like, hey, your daughter died, so don't bother the master anymore. He has a lot of work to do. He has a lot of other things that um, he could be doing, better things that he could be doing, so don't bother him, don't ask him to come. And 
And Jesus overhears, and he's like, I'm still coming. Like, you can't really tell me what to do. Like, I can do whatever I want. So he <laughs> gets rid of the crowd, and he's like, okay, I'm going to bring my select few people, and I am going to go see this girl. So this is where we find ourselves in the story now. We see that all hope is lost. And Jesus shows up to weeping and wailing people, a huge commotion. Um, and that's just the scene. Like, if you could just picture that, like, this little girl, she is gone. And she was going to get healed, and Jesus was on his way. They had the right guy. And she died. And people were just weeping and wailing. And there's nothing really anyone can really do. Um, so now, going back on May 17th, 2019, it was a very special day. It was graduation day. Um, I was getting my associates and a bunch of other people getting their bachelor's degrees and we were so excited, like school was finally done. We had final chapel, we had so much to look forward to. And also it was my birthday, so remember that, May 17th, it's coming up soon. So write that down in your notes, if you will. Um, but so that was a, it was a really awesome day, a really awesome start. And it's my birthday. We had final chapel. And I remember in the middle of final chapel, I get a text from Val. And she's like, hey, um, happy birthday. Like, congratulations. You made it. You're graduating. Like, you and Shiloh are graduating. We got to graduate on the same day. And I was like, thank you. And she's like, I just have a quick question for you. Like, when are you planning on coming home for the summer? And at that point, I was like, oh, I'm going to take about maybe like two weeks. Like, I'm going to stay for a couple weeks. And because I wanted to spend time here, spend time with my friends, and then go home for the summer. And she goes, okay, I'm not trying to scare you or anything, but I think you should consider coming home a little earlier just because things with Sean aren't going too well. And at that point, I was like, okay, like, I still believe that we still, like, serve a miracle-working God. Like, I still believe that he's going to be healed. And I didn't want to think about it on that day. I was like, I just want to graduate, and I want to spend time with my friends, and I want to just hang out. So um, we graduate, we get our degrees, yay, we've done school. Um, then we go to the Hawthorne food carts. I'm sure you guys have been there like five million times by now, <laughs> especially at PVC. But um, that place is great. So we went there, and I... I'm getting my food at this like Mediterranean cart, I don't really remember. Um, and I'm waiting in line, and then I get a call from Shyla. <laughs> um, and she, and you know when I said in the beginning, like if you get this like deep, like you kind of know that something bad's gonna happen when someone calls you. I didn't have that when Shyla um, called me, cause I was just like, oh, she's just gonna, I don't know, say happy birthday or something, even though we saw each other. So she um, called me up and she said, hey, are you with people? Like, are you with friends? And I was like, yeah, I'm with people. Are you with people? Like, how are you doing? Like, what's going on? <laughs> She's like, I just want to make sure you're around friends right now. And I was like, okay, I want to make sure you're around friends. Like, sounds good. Um, and then she got really, really quiet. And she said, I have to let you know, like, I don't remember word by word for what she said because I kind of blocked out, but she said, hey, um, Sean actually just passed away, and he passed away around the time that we were graduating, so, sorry, So when I got that news, I was like, okay, nice. So I start crying in the middle of the food carts. Like, everyone's kind of looking at me like, ooh, is she okay? I'm like loudly crying too. And he, this guy, <laughs> this guy looks at me and he like sees me crying. He, this is the one thing I remember is that he like ran up to me, started giving me tissues. Like he started like, he's like, are you okay? okay? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. So I run out of the food carts and I sit on the sidewalk on the ground <laughs> and I just like start bawling and I'm like, I can't believe that, like this didn't happen, like that didn't just happen. 
and people are walking by me, but they're like, oh, this is Portland, like nothing new, just a psychopath on the ground. <laughs> so I'm just like sitting there crying. I'm calling people, I'm calling my best friend who's in Australia at the time, or she's still there, but I call her, I'm like, what do we do? And she's crying and she's like, I don't know. And that's all like, I could say was, what can we do? And at this time, Jesus saw a commotion of people weeping and wailing loudly. And that's what it was for the longest time, you guys. It was so hard. I had to rush back home. I had the worst, the worst experience at the border. I had to drive. Some people were there. Aiden, he was there. He, we drove to the border, and it was so weird. Like, I was crying. I didn't know what was going on, and it, just, it all happened so, so fast. And I got home, and I was like... I don't, what do we do? Like, what's happening? And all you see is a commotion of people weeping and wailing. <clears throat> and that's when I was like, why trouble the teacher any further? Um, Jesus, you don't need to come anymore. Like, um, he's gone. Don't, don't worry. I still think you're a good God, and I still think you're a miracle worker, but you don't have to come anymore because... I, I think you've heard by now that Sean is no longer here. And that was kind of my prayer. I still believed in God and I still thought he was a good God and that he was a miracle worker God. But I was like, don't bother coming. Like, it's fine. Um, and that's kind of where I was for the longest time. I think a lot of us from back at home, that's where we were for a long time was, okay, like, what do we do now? But like, it's, it's going to be okay. And now I'm going to jump finally to the final part of the story of Jairus' daughter's story in uh, verse 39. And it says, And when he had entered, he has said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, and they put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went and where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai. I don't know if I said that right. Forgive me. I don't know. It's in Hebrew. Anyways, <laughs> which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And you guys, that was the main event. That was what Jairus was waiting for. He was like, yes, like, I've been waiting for this. Like, I brought the right guy. Like, that is a miracle working man. And my daughter is alive, and I feel like an idiot for crying and weeping and all this stuff. But I brought the right guy. That was, Jesus did it again. And that's going down in the books, and that's being written down. He did it again. And that was it. That was the main event. That was what we were waiting for in this story. We were waiting for the miracle, and the miracle came. And um, I, I can have the um, band come up. I know it's a little early, but um, if the band wants to start coming up. Um, and this is where I find myself today, is kind of in this part of the story. And I'm just going to tell you guys right now, no, Sean, he didn't get resurrected. He is still gone. Um, he's been gone for two years. Um, May 17th, that will be um, two years exactly that he's been gone. And don't worry, I'm not just going to leave you guys with a sad story. Um, I need to encourage you guys because this is what's been on my heart for so, so long is that I'm eternally, eternally grateful for the time I've had with Sean and he changed my life and he changed other people's lives and his kids and his wife, they're, they're doing, they're, they're grieving, they're, they lost their dad, she lost her husband, but they're actively, actively choosing God every single day. And the point that I need to make that I can't leave the stage without making is that um, God is life even if death is involved and there is life and death. And the thought that I wanted to share with you guys is that even if Jesus did not intend to heal 
Jairus' daughter, he would have still come to the house and he would still come to comfort his people. And guys, God is life whether death occurs or not. <laughs> like, that is the main truth. And our grief, our mourning, our suffering, it doesn't stop him from showing up. <laughs> like, he still shows up anyways. And when I said, God, like, don't come anymore. Like, I don't need to trouble the teacher any further. He still showed up and he's still here and he's still here every single day in my life. And guys, I, I don't know how much I can stress that we need to represent, represent the life God is even when death is involved. And today, speaking about grief, speaking about mourning, grief is something that everyone goes through and it doesn't have to be grief of a physical person. It's grief of a relationship not going the way you want it to, losing a job, grief of something being taken away from you, grief of a loved one suffering, grief of COVID, <laughs> for goodness sakes. We've been grieving over COVID for like years. Um, <laughs> grief of dealing with an addiction or mental illness that just won't go away. Grief over being insecure, grief of family crisis is. Whatever is affecting your heart that causes it to break, that is what grieving is. And I hope, and I know MCA, you guys are still really young. We're all still really young, but if you haven't felt this yet, I pray that you never do. <laughs> but the reality is, is that we're all going to go through it. And the only way we're going to make it through it is if we know that God is life and we represent that life. Amen. And the thing, like, how do we do this? Like, okay, yeah, I get it. We have to represent life. Okay, like, what are some steps that I can do because this stuff is hard and it can be hard? And remembering where God has shown up for us in the past, like, the fact that I even got to meet Sean, <laughs> The fact that I even got to meet this amazing man, <clears throat> the fact that I got to meet his family and I still get to hang out with his family. Like when I move home, I get to hang out with his kids. I get to hang out with his wife. I get to hang out with all these people that he impacted. The fact that we even got the privilege to meet this man is God giving us a gift. And guys, we have to be there for one another. We have to, and I'm just, I'm not going to sugarcoat it here at PBC. We've been going through some stuff, <laughs> and there's people that you know that are going through this right now, and if you're not, and if you're not there for them, oh my gosh, I'm crying so much, if you're not there for them, it sucks, and it hurts, and you guys, we need to be there for each other. We need to love each other. The Another big thing that you guys need to know is that we need to keep the truth of God ahead of us, and we need to proclaim who God is. And proclaiming who God is, this is how we get out of the weeping and the wailing stage. This is how we stop feeling sorry for ourselves. And man, this person's gone. That's how we get out of it, and we get to go into how we get to be, what does it say here? where we get to be immediately overcome with amazement. That's how we transition from the weeping and the wailing and the God, why didn't you come? Like you're the miracle working God, why didn't you come? I'm so confused, but we get to move from that. We get to go, you know what? I'm amazed by you. <laughs> Every single day, I'm amazed by you. Proclaiming who God is is, one of the hardest things to do, especially when it doesn't make any sense, especially when there's things in your life that you're like, guys, I still don't know why Sean never got healed. I still don't get that. I still don't know why people are still getting sick. I still don't know why there's crises and there's diseases. I still don't get it, but I still choose to praise God and be like, you are good and you do perform miracles. And there was a time in my life where I was like, man, I don't even know if God can perform miracles, like maybe he does, but maybe I'm not going to see one. 
But I can tell you, I have never been more faith-filled in my entire life to know that I, I serve the God that healed Jairus' daughter. I, that, guy, that guy in the story, this guy in the story that we read about, that that's the same person <laughs> that we get to talk to every single day, and that's the same God that we get to serve and love and represent in our lives. That's the same dude. <laughs> like, when you read in the Bible, it's the same man. And that is how we move from the, tra- from the traumatic, the tragedy, into the amazement, into the, you know what? I'm going to represent the life that God is even when death is involved, if it's involved or not. Whether I ask him to come, he comes. Whether I am sad and grieving and still confused, he still comes and he's still coming. And that is how we can be filled with amazement every day, especially when hard things happen to us, especially when grieving happens and um, things that don't make sense happen to us. There's this song. um, It's called even when it hurts by Hillsong. And I just wanted to share the lyrics with you guys because this is a song that has helped me get through a lot of things because the lyrics are so important. And I'm just gonna read. I would encourage you guys to listen to the whole song, but this is some of the lyrics that have helped me. And it says, even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words, I'll praise you louder than I will sing your praise. Even if it makes no sense, I'll praise you. And as, I know I went a little short, but as, as we go into this song, as the band starts singing again, can we do that? Can we just sing his praise louder and louder no matter what's going on in our lives? Can we proclaim that God is good? Can we proclaim that he is still life and we get to represent that life that he is, whether death occurs or not? Can we sing that? I will sing louder and louder and louder even though I am suffering, even though I'm sad. Like I will sing your praises over and over again and then eventually, and I don't know if you guys are going through it right now or if you had, Eventually, you'll get to being immediately amazed, and I promise you that because that's where I am right now, and that's where hopefully a lot of other people are, and I'm just here to encourage you guys that there is so much good that comes from, as morbid as it sounds, is there's so much good that comes from death, and as I'm looking at the screen, I see good grief. <laughs> like, grief can be good, and it's necessary. Like, don't try to push it down. Don't try to push your emotions down. It's necessary. It really is. But you can't stay there forever. And you need to start realizing that we serve an amazing God. So as I said, let's just go back into worship and let's just, let's just praise him no matter what's going on right now. And we go into all night prayer tonight. Let's just do that for the whole day, the whole night. (laughs) So yeah, thank you.
Come on, PBC. What a message. Thank you, Vanessa. I think that uh, with aspects like grief, like we all go through, the important thing like Vanessa highlighted is to be there. And the important thing is to be there. Don't act like you have all the answers, but just be the friend that's there. And then as this Easter season is, is it's post Easter season and we're, we're past the resurrection, we now have this hope that death has no power. And it might have a little bit of hurt right now, but man, when Jesus comes back, we get to see everybody. That's the hope we have. So let's pray. Let's pray and wrap up and, and just celebrate in that fact. God, thank you, Lord, that with the resurrection, you took the power back from death. Death has no hold on us, God. We have this confident hope, life in your son, Jesus. Thank you so much. God, I pray, Lord, as we go out, we go out into this week, we go into all night prayer, we go into international week coming up, Lord, that we have that as our confidence, that it's literally seen in our step, that we can, we can hope again. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful gift of salvation, for eternal life with you. And Father, I, I just pray blessings and provision over us as we go out. And thank you so much. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.